Okay. Oops. Let me just reduce my thing. Great. So thank you very much, Sarah, for the introduction um, and um, for inviting me to speak in this course. Uh, a lot of what I share with you this morning, afternoon, evening, draws on my work in the water sector as an academic, as an activist, as a practitioner, and also as a um, policy advocate. And I am going to be uh, taking off from the previous speaker's work and, 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 and words on culture and water and look at uh, re relations of power, of exclusion, of gender, of caste, of what it means when we talk about sacred waters. And, and, um, and then, you know, do that through sharing um, images and stories from our archive at the Live Living Waters Museum. Because when I started this work, I was not only very keen to communicate around water and to engage you, but to ensure that the stories that we do on water and how we look at water, not only is it you know, interdisciplinary and intersectional, but that intersectionality really needs to look at questions of power. So the stories that we have on the Living Waters Museum repository try and examine some of these questions, some of these issues without being overtly uh, political or, or you know, taking a, a, a view on big dams or other issues because the India that we live in right now, as probably many of you know, is quite different from the India where a lot of us did our research and did our activism in the 80s and 90s. So we live in an India where the word human rights means that you're not going to get funded. And talking about rights-based work also is, is a bit of a challenge. So we have to be very careful how we do all of that. So Javier talked a lot about the, the framework for looking at water. And so I'm not going to repeat some of the things which you already uh, uh, spoke about, but as a marker of change, when you look at water, you can, you know, there are so many lenses through which you can approach it from the political lens of, you know, the, the sort of uh, policy statements around water, the economic paradigms, the commodification of water vis-a-vis -vis the human right to water. Um, the ecological and environmental space, the social space where we look at vulnerability, gender, who's in, who's out, and of course that interfaces with the cultural space. But none of these spaces like water itself are bound by, uh, by you know, I mean, obviously they all operate in institutional structures, but they're also fluid spaces. So I want to look at some of that. Javier also talked a lot about what UNESCO said on water and culture. So I'm not going to repeat, you know, definitions of culture and cultural diversity. But when we look at frameworks like integrated water resource management, when we talk about a new ethical paradigm for, for water, the word culture and cultural diversity are very uh, integral to, to that understanding of, of the way we look at water. So there are many cultural manifestations of water from holy water and what you see in the picture on the left is, or oh, the right for you, I think, uh, the, the, the Ganges uh, coming down from heaven through the locks of Lord Shiva here. You see the parting of the waters, um, Moses crossing over, crossing the holy land. You see a, a bridge being built um, to enter, to travel to Sri Lanka from India, Hanuman and the gods, and that's part of a very famous mythology, the Ramayan in India. It's, a, it's one of the two uh, sort of stories that have been immortalized in Indian art and heritage and more. Holy water is there for baptism. Uh, for Muslims, it's part of the I mean, it's, it's a ritual before you go to, to pray, to wash your feet, to wash your hands, et cetera. And there'll always be a source of water in, the, uh, in, in a mosque outside. 
And of course, uh, in large parts of uh, India and other countries where there is a very strong Hindu culture, the whole notion of having a ritual dip, and this I think is in the, in the Ganges, in the Ganga at Varanasi, the holy city of Varanasi. Uh, these pictures are taken from Clip Colleagues' uh, uh, slides when we, when we were uh, both doing a similar course, but this is really where I started my journey on water. My PhD research was on the cleaning of the Ganga and what it meant in terms of people who were being excluded from that technology of you know, water treatment and pollution control. Um, people whose livelihoods, whose practices were embedded in a re re relationship with the Ganga and this was the first Ganga action plan, in fact, that was launched in the late 1980s by the then Indian Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi. And since then, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a fallacy to say that since the over the last 30 years, billions have been poured into cleaning the Ganga. And it's still the same. So, you know, one, one will come back to that later. But... When I went to, to study this Red River and I was doing my PhD in Cambridge, the idea that people are having a, a holy dip where you see uh, carcasses of dead animals sometimes flowing near the edge of the water where the, where the steps meet the water, or you, you, know, you have garlands on the surface and you have all sorts of other things there. Sometimes I have a photograph somewhere of, of uh, the dead bodies of two small uh, kids because uh, children you do not uh, cremate in, in India and people are very poor sometimes to you know bury a child so the, the children were often just thrown into the water because the gang the gang the Ganges absorbs sil uh, sins and it allows you to achieve moksha, reincarnation, etc. You know, so that's all very important. Water, I mean, also people go to bathe and to have a ritual dip because they, they want something. It's a prayer. Often it's a prayer for fertility, for women who want to conceive um, water as, as, as healing, the hot springs that you see across countries like Japan and many other places in the Western world as well, the notion of hot springs. Even in India, we have hot springs up in the mountains and people go there and bathe in those hot springs. So they're famous for their uh, medicinal properties, etc. cetera. Um, I like the first thing which I forgot, which is where I was going to start from actually, when I went to the Ganga and looked at the work of Mary Douglas, an American anthropologist who, uh, you know, talked about dirt as, as matter out of place. So what you and I may conceive and may see as physical manifestations of dirt, like the garlands and the dead bodies, et cetera, are not really dirty, you know? I mean, they're not really, it's not that they're not dirty, but they're not seen as uh, dirt in different understandings of what is pure and what is impure. So let's look at some of these things. Let's let me uh, talk about social relations of power in the context of India and South Asia, because I think that was uh, some of the questions that were, were raised were around those issues. So when we look at ancient and indigenous systems of water and social organization, I think, I mean, we have all our ancient civilizations, which I think previous speakers have talked about from Mesopotamia to the Nile Valley to the Indus civilization in South Asia, which go back uh, BC many, many years, you know, and we've seen and we've found through archeological ex excavations, uh, the first wells, the first, the ways that people manage water through canards and other things as well. And in India, of course, we have um, a legacy of these step wells that were built uh, between the seventh century to as late as the 1800s. Many, and they go 
from, they're not all over India. They're, there are different types of whales across, but I'm talking a little bit about the steppe whales, which you find in where I am currently speaking from, um, Ahmedabad in Gujarat in Western India, and the steppe whales go all the way up to Central Asia as well, because that was the um, caravan route for, for travelers, for, for goods and all of that. So what's interesting to note is that many of these step wells were funded by women. I mean, at least they, there's a believe me anecdotally that at least 25% of them were funded by women who were the wives of wealthy uh, kings or patrons or merchants. And they did it as a meritorious act, but also it was an act, it was um, articulation of agency by these, by the women. And that's important because that really goes back so many hundreds of years that women were, uh, can or could be defined now as the first, I mean, very early uh, hyd hydrophilanthropists. And there is a word, by the way, hydrophilanthropy is a field. Um, so women, I mean, this was really quite amazing that women funded and supported a lot of this construction. Many of these step whales, many of the famous step whales, like the Queen step whale, Rani Ki Bab in Patan, many of them are obviously named um, by the women who funded them. Sometimes the name of the woman has been removed and the name of her husband has gone in. But step whales uh, exist to today. Unfortunately, many of them have been abandoned. People, it's like, you know, you, sometimes you don't know that there is a step well in my backyard. It's not possible to restore and renovate all the step wells. Um, and many of them, if the underground spring is, is dried up, then there's no point. You can't do much about it. But there are some very good examples. I will share a link later with Sara Lucetta uh, of an article that came out on the BBC uh, last week the BBC app about step wells in India and the potential for water security. So we have a national water policy and a, and a mission right now in India that looks at what have now become secondary water sources, step wells and wells and ponds and rivers, but they were initially our primary water source sources. And that mission, which is called Jal Jeevan, Water for Life, is looking at what we can do with some of these things. And there are places, um, for example, in the desert region of Kutch, I sit on the board of an NGO which works locally over there, which has uh, restored some of you know, smaller step wells, not as intricate and not uh, as the, the one in the image of the air. But these are, and they had done it, um, and it provided water security for 600 households at a time when they were getting piped water every nine to 10 days. So you can imagine what that really means. But um, I wanna say that, you know, whilst these are beautiful places, architectural wonders, uh, there's a lot of intricate carving work here. You can see on the Living Waters Museum, you can see uh, there's a link to more of the work that we've done on step wells. There are beautiful coffee table books on step wells. We were trying to document some of these stories and try to bring them to, to life with, with sound and music and audio. Uh, we haven't got very far with it, but there have been exhibitions. One of your uh, participants on the course has also been part of some of this work. And, um, I think there is potential, but that potential where it has succeeded has been because of public-private partnerships that have emerged to restore some of these wells. But I also want to say um, that from the last point I made as well, that uh, while these step wells are beautiful places and women used to go and fetch water, travelers would sit and talk and rest because they're very cool as you go down these subterranean chambers. They can go down for 40, 50 feet sometimes, the uh, steps. Um, but many people were also excluded from them and whether it was by caste or whether they were by faith, Sometimes the very artisans who built these step wells were not allowed to go there because they were of a different faith. So it's, you have, one has to be a little careful when one talks about culture and indigenous uh, communities and all the beautiful things that we had, but there were also a lot of re relations around uh, inequality and exclusion. 
So we had a story and we have a story on, on Live Living Waters Museum uh, that was developed by one of our interns um, for, as part of his graduation project from the National Institute of Design, which is one of the premier institutes in India and indeed in the world. And he um, looked at the step well through the eyes of a little girl who is in a futuristic world going in search for water and falls down one of these wells and uh, is, uh, encounters a world which you see in the right hand corner uh, where you know it's the sort of um, rural India where there's no water people it's all uh, this desolate landscape because all the water is being sucked up by the taps so instead of the taps uh, you know uh, water flowing down the water is being sucked up from the aquifers to uh, to support urbanization, etc. So this little girl, Munna, has to find her way out of the step well and in the process engages with uh, oracles. And of course, the one deed that she has to do is, is switch off these taps. So it's very much like the Alice in Wonderland story for those of you who've read that. Um, the, and of course, it gives agency to a young girl. Our idea was to use the storyboard to develop it as a video game for children and you know, different uh, levels, different um, actors that they would encounter, different stakeholders, et cetera. But of course, developing a video game <laughs> requires a lot more funds than what Living Waters Museum can do. But it's a story we hope that the government, which is now developing a virtual museum on water for children, will think about in use. So also when, when we look back at, uh, you know, how social organization around water, what, what does it mean, um, despite issues of caste and, and exclusion, we see a lot of these uh, parabs, they are earthen pots, and water was stored in them and made available to any passerby who was walking down the street, there would be a, um, a glass sometimes there, a steel glass and a um, laid, ladle a, like a soup spoon where you could you know scoop the water out from the pot and also when in in India in which is sometimes I used to find it very hard when who's doing my field work when you drink water from a common glass or a common bottle you never put your lips to it you just you know pour it down and then rinse it out and then put it back over there so anyone could take water from this and now you don't see that so much but you see that the earthen pots have been replaced by uh, plastic containers. In many cases, they've been replaced by huge uh, metal uh, and steel containers, which are like um, coolers in, in some of the urban areas and people can go and take water from, from there. Um, and what else? There are also sort of copper vessels and all of that. So this was a story again done by a, a photo essay done by one of our NID uh, students. Uh, documenting how these various parts and things had changed and what forms were they available in right now. Also, basically, more or less free water. Um, not sure how many of you have heard of the Bishtis, but they, again, like the step wells, Bishtis were found in uh, India, across some parts of South Asia, again, up to Central Asia. And they were, it was a hereditary occupation also. And men in, were carrying these big um, le leather pouches made from goat skin and almost about 35 to 40 liters of water in one of these pouches. And he is uh, selling, selling it to local businesses, et cetera, in, that, in the wards where they are, in, in, usually in the old uh, by lanes and, and all. And, um, they sell it for people who like little restaurants, little cafes, little businesses over there. Obviously, it's not a large amount of water, but they're also dying out now because more and more you're seeing piped water systems coming in. And so, as you can see in this picture, the man is carrying water, not only in the pouch, but also in two buckets in his hand. And the Bishtis, um, they're seen as angels. I mean, the, the word is a Persian. It comes from Persian, from the word uh, Bahish, which means uh, paradise. And they're seen as angels of mercy. 
So again, the association of water with salvation, with, uh, with something holy as well. So just think about what I showed you in the first few slides, but how it has been seen practically speaking. So these were the Bishtis and they were always men. There are no women here as Bishtis. We also have a lot of uh, public fountains in India from the days of uh, colonial rule, but also prior to that, which were developed and I mean, funded by uh, wealthy philanthropists who again wanted to support, you know, water, free water for people. Unfortunately, many of these are not working anymore. And, um, um, what was I going to say? Yeah. So when we had, so last year, oh no, in March this year, sorry, time is so different now when we've all been locked up and locked out. But uh, in March uh, this year on World Water Day, we launched an online exhibition called Confluence, which looked at Mum Mumbai's water histories, uh, livelihoods, journeys, heritage, uh, the marine life, and many aspects of that. So I would encourage you to look at Confluence because we worked on Confluence as part of a very large partnership that was launched one year ago, almost August, September, 2020. And everyone, you know, working from home in lockdown, didn't really know who they all were. Uh, about 35 people, professionals, artists, urban planners, architects, conservation architects, young researchers, students, and um, yeah, photographers, everyone. They came together to produce this amazing exhibition. And we, Living Waters Museum, funded the work and also hosted it. And we will then take it into our archives. So that has really influenced the way we are looking at water right now. We're looking at urban waterscapes. So this is also something that one of our conservation architects had done. And this is the, the one that you see in the main picture is that's Flora Fountain, the goddess Flora. And this is like the heart of Mumbai. And it's a beautiful fountain. It's um, sarconic architecture. And it was recently uh, restored. And it's really, really worth looking at. It's very beautiful. So what the conservation architect Rahul Chambhuka did was also draw sketches of these things. And the idea was to, you know, share them with, if we were ever going to have a physical exhibition, which we are now thinking about given that things are opening up. But the work in Mumbai has also influenced us to look at urban waterscapes across India. So we're currently working in Calcutta and uh, where I am based in Pune in Ahmedabad, where I'm currently visiting, and in Rajasthan, in Jodhpur, uh, we're looking at different relationships with urban waters, because um, in a way, when you have a virtual museum, you also want to be doing work that is locally contextualized, and since everyone is based in, you know, different parts of India and working from home with us, we thought it was nice that they could do some work that was more locally embedded. So I mentioned to you that we talked about caste and, and class and power and social relations and gender in, in, our, in our stories. So this was also a story uh, done for Living Waters News for, for this Confluence exhibition by a young uh, artist student from NID as well. And uh, this is a very interesting event that happened in 1927 where Ambedkar, the father of the Indian constitution, led almost 2,000, 3,000 people, uh, mostly from the lower caste communities, from the Dalit communities. I hope everyone knows what, uh, when I say the word caste, what that means in India, or, you know, because it's a system of uh, social stratification that is heredit hereditary and also, um, the, the stratification gives you different degrees of purity, different degrees of power. It's often occupational. So you will have the priests on the top and at the bottom you'll have the um, Dalit community or what are called, also called the scheduled caste in India because they have certain rights and reservations for them. But the caste system also means that people who are at the bottom always did the menial work, you know, like scavenging, like cleaning, like removing rubbish and all of that. So when we start looking at what is a community water source, 
we will see that, uh, and, it, and it's still pre prevalent now, and even now in India, in many villages, uh, the, um, the lower caste, the um, Dalits are not allowed to drink water from, you know, what is seen as a community well, for example. So Ambedkar wanted to break all of this, and in, he organized this in a village in, in Maharashtra called uh, Ma Mahad, and Satyagar is uh, Ogra is what uh, Gandhi did, the non-violent uh, non peaceful means of protest, and he organized that. And that day, which is March 20th, uh, 1927, but for, for, for since then, March 20th in India has been observed as a social empowerment day. So, and that was just a few days before World Water Day. So that's really interesting as well. So again, how we uh, talked about the human right to water as a story in a, in a graphic art form. But you will see that, as I said, that these practices continue often when you go to a little tea shop by the roadside in India, and you, know, you will see that there are different glasses kept for uh, people from the lower caste communities to drink water or drink tea. Um, people in their own homes, the, the staff that they have working with them, they will have their utensils often kept separately and so on. And then in many ways, there is all sorts of other forms of discrimination. And for women who used to, who come from these communities and they have to, and I'll talk a bit about gender now, but women who have to walk further to collect water were also then uh, subject to being, often being raped by the higher and upper caste men. And uh, in India also when, uh, Modi became the, when in his first term as prime minister, he launched this very massive national sanitation movement to basically build a toilet for every house in India, because, you know, uh, India has the largest number of people who practice out, uh, out what is it called, outdoor defecation. And um, so that was something that's been, you know, criticized a lot. And of course, it leads to other things, leads to I mean, the whole fecal contamination route, and then it impacts on nutrition and children's health and so on. So we've had a lot of incidences where girls from the Dalit community have also been raped by, and, and sometimes killed, just for the right of going because they didn't have a toilet and they, or they were going out to a public toilet at night, you know? Uh, of course, that doesn't mean that you equate the development of toilets with a de decrease in, in violence against when women and girls. It's not that. It's not that easy to do that. And it doesn't make sense, though, of course, some of the organizations, even the ones that I sit on the board of, looked at toilets from that lens. And it's not, I mean, it is there for human dig dignity and everyone wants a toilet, but it's not that once you do it, girls don't uh, get raped. Or attacked. We worked as part of the exhibition with a rights-based uh, advocacy group in Bombay that was called the Pani Huck Samiti. The uh, Pani is, is one more word for water. By the way, in India, there are like a hundred different words for water, and it depends on what water it is and where it's coming from and who's using it and what is it being used for. So uh, we have a large uh, informal community. I mean, I don't want to call don't want to call them slums and poor, but we have a large migrant population in Mum, Mum, Mumbai and who obviously don't live, you know, in, 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 in proper homes and houses and all. So for them, access to piped water systems is very difficult because they can't show that they have legal ownership of their house or their land. And so this group was fighting for that and, and they won an award winning, I think it was in 2014. Uh, 2010 was the UN Human Declaration of the UN Declaration on the Human Right to Water, and I think they won their case in 2014. And so the way we looked at their struggles was to design a calendar for 2020. It's online as well, and we picked up uh, milestones that are important in the struggle for water um, across the year. So that's one of the ways that we were representing this to make it accessible to people. Um, 
Yeah, that was some of the photographer uh, reporters that worked on the story and tried to capture some of the images. They've been doing it for some time. So the story on the website also has images and it also has uh, audio clips of activists uh, uh, speaking. And obviously there are English uh, sub subtitles there as well. The last thing I want to talk a little bit about is gender and water because gender is something uh, gender and equity is something I have been uh, working on in the water sector for more than 20 years now and was one of the first people in India to be working on this and to be a, a spokesperson for this for issues of, around gender and water. So this uh, story that you see here, which I'm not going to read to you, um, but again, we when before we moved to Pune, we were based at the university here in Ahmedabad, and we were able to work with the physical museum before, of course, this was I'm talking about 2018, which had an amazing private collection of water utensils. Now, some of these utensils, like the pots you see this one woman carrying, are uh, more than a hundred years old. But as museums typically are in this part of the world, dusty corridors, not much interest in you know, working, or I mean, not much interest by children there, et cetera. So the museum is also linked to a restaurant which serves uh, typical Indian food. You sit on the floor, it's a thali, and it's all very wholesome and all. So we looked at some of these vessels and we did uh, stories, we call them pot stories, and we'd have them translated in Gujarati as well as English. I mean, they were in English translated in Gujarati for the exhibition that we created around the pots. And we use the pots uh, to perform, to do music, which you can also do on, on the pots. And whether the pot is half full or half empty, it has different sounds. So we had, we had music, we had the pots, and we, had, we also looked at uh, virtual water in terms of the food that the rest of the restaurant was serving. So how much water is taken to grow certain crops and cook certain food and so on. And that's a whole different topic of conversation. But um, so I talk about gender and I want to bring it back to what I said in the beginning about those beautiful step wells and women's agency in terms of art and architecture in India, how many hundreds of years ago and now when we see the story of water in India, it is one of uh, a huge amount of hardship, of um, unpaid labor across the country, the time that women spend in fetching water, what it means for girls' access to schools, what it means when you don't have toilets in schools, what it means for, for girls who are adolescent, um, and, and also uh, menstrual hygiene and so on. So these are the issues that I have been very closely working on and supporting. And of course, the board, when I sit on the board of water aid and organizations like that, this is what we uh, do. We talk about the rights of children, water education, particularly for girls, um, <clears throat> menstrual health and menstrual hygiene and all. Now, this doesn't mean that men don't go to fetch water. And I think that's one of the things that when you look at gender, you tend to look at it from a um, woman's lens and you don't really also bring in men into the conversation. And that's extremely important because we talk a lot about empowering women, empowering girls, and then the men get left behind. And when they get left behind, that is also leading to a whole new set of issues, violence and uh, alcohol drink and cons alcohol consumption, drugs, et cetera. We're seeing that happening. So men do fetch water uh, when there are villages which are facing extreme drought, when you have to go far away to fetch water, when you have to so, uh, walk, um, or when you're likely to face a conflict from a neighboring village, that's when men do fetch water. But men will never head load water. They will have, they will carry water on their uh, bicycles or they'll have a wheelbarrow or they'll have something, but you will never really see a man and not just in India. I think this would also pertain to many parts of Africa, head loading water. So we've spent a lot of time talking about women's uh, reproductive roles, their domestic work in, uh, not, not, not in fetching water, but also their uh, uh, sorry, their productive work, not reproductive, productive work in terms of agriculture and other income generating activities and their need for water uh, for those uh, 
um, for those for those things. And what that often means in a, in countries like India, where women's land ownership is so low, what it means is that um, um, women cannot access irrig water for irrigation, particularly when their men are when their husbands are not there. When they've migrated to villages and so on, so that's something that they do face. Um, I can go on and on talking about gender and water, but I also think we're running out of time. But uh, I know many of you will say, oh, but her title was Sacred Waters. But for us, water is sacred in many forms, not just, you know, the holy water and the spiritual water and the water in the temples and the mosques and the churches. But for, we are looking at sacredness also from an aspect of um, profane water. I mean, what does our everyday water mean? What does our everyday, what do our everyday water practices mean? And so we had also done an exhibition, which you can also see through our website, which was a global call for work and poetry and music and sound and visuals on women's water work. Um, you can read that. It's really, it's a wonderful uh, exhibition. We launched it in 2019. And a lot of uh, people contributed to it. And I think we'd like to maybe see how we can expand this a bit. Um, I'm not gonna talk more about that right now. This is my last picture because we're also looking beyond museums and we're also looking at natural water heritage as well as cultural and built and assets and all. And often when we talk about addressing women's water needs, we say, okay, let's put a hand pump in a village. Let's do this, let's do that. But also many of these spaces, like this picture was taken by a Dutch friend probably 20 years ago when we were doing some field work together. And he captured these women in conversation. And that's what a lot of the common water spaces were all about, whether it was the step wells, whether it was the, the journey for fetching water, whether it was, you know, sitting by a pond or any other water source and washing your utensils and your clothes together. Many of these spaces also provided women with opportunities for conversation, to share their stories, their, uh, their grief, their concerns, whether they were being eaten up by their husbands or not. I would strongly recommend a movie. I'll put it down in the chat box later. It's set in a village, a fictional village in North uh, Africa, or the Middle East, is the film is called The Source. Um, and it talks about this and how women struggling for water on a daily basis then decide to go on a love strike because their men don't do anything. The men sit in the village and they don't want to fix the, you know, leaking. They don't want to bring water through the pipeline into the village and so on. And how these women then negotiate relations of power, relations of intimacy, of faith, because it's a Muslim village and how they eventually win. And it's a very powerful movie. I don't know how you'll see it because it's not, it's not one of those downloadable ones, but I'll put it down and maybe you can figure out how to see it. Um, I think that's all I have to say for now. I'm happy to take some questions.